Hello and welcome to the Art of Health podcast, where we dive deep into the art of unlocking your true potential and transforming your health aesthetics and performance. I'm your host, Marie Steffen, your health and fitness coach with over a decade of experience in this field. In this podcast, I'll be sharing my personal best tips, valuable insights, and the wisdom gained from coaching thousands of people just like you. Hey guys, welcome back to another The Art of Health podcast episode. This episode is the second part of the progress series because last time I talked about what progress is and how you can measure it in terms of your aesthetic goals, meaning weight loss and muscle gain. I will link the episode in the description below this video if you missed it. And suiting to the last episode, we will today get clarity about how you can measure improvements in strength, endurance and mobility. Many of you might think this is very easy to see. Either you used more weights, did more reps, ran faster or got deeper into stretch, but it's actually not that simple. Especially the higher your training age is, meaning your fitness level, the less obvious progress you will make because you have already utilized a big chunk of your fitness potential. Therefore, many athletes think they didn't make progress if they used the same amount of weights, for example, for two to four weeks. But with today's insights on what progress is in terms of training, you will see how much you might actually improve and have improved on a weekly basis. Of course, all principles I'm talking about today require following a cohesive workout plan designed to make progress and build more volume week by week. So if you don't follow a plan that encompasses the required pillars for muscle growth and increase in performance, then you're welcome to join my hybrid body program in which I'm putting a lot of thought into to ensure optimal results in strength, endurance and mobility and also your aesthetic goals that you can achieve with it. You will find the link to that program in the description below this video or in the show notes of the platform you're listening from if you don't watch and listen to this podcast on YouTube. So I'm not addressing lab measurements or tests done by special machines that most people can't access unless you are a sports scientist or something of that nature. Although I think that tests like VO2 max tests, for example, for endurance capacity or other types of max strength tests are interesting and great if you have access to those measurement tools, but I don't think they are necessary or more helpful to stay motivated on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why I want to talk about about practical ways how you can notice, see and make progress from workout to workout without fancy measurement tools because that's important to stay on track and keep your motivation up. First, I want to tackle the question of how you can identify strength gains followed by what amount of strength gains you can expect at a certain level of training. In general, progress in training can be expressed in an increase in volume or intensity. The most obvious way to notice an increase in strength is an increase in the weight you're lifting for a given number of reps. Let's say you squatted 40 kilograms for eight reps in week one of your program and 45 kilograms for five reps in week two. The progress is pretty simple to notice. And to expand on that example, if the individual lifts now 45 kilos for eight reps and three sets in week one and lifts the same weight for eight reps and four sets in the second week, then the person might not have increased weight, but the overall load that's been lifted in that session. The overall load, also called volume, is the product of weight times reps times sets. That means for our example, the individual lifted 1080 kilograms, that's 45 kilograms for eight reps and three sets as the total load 
in week one and 1440 kilos as the total load in week two which should definitely be seen as progress now as we talked about training volume which as i said previously describes the total workload of a training session expressed in weight times reps times sets there remains another factor that comes into play which is the intensity at which you are training Training at a high volume doesn't necessarily mean that you trained at a high intensity, like the difficulty of a set. An example of a low intensity set would be a set of 10 reps of back squats with a weight that you could actually perform 14 reps with. That shows that you didn't perform the set close to your maximum weight for the given reps and therefore at a lower intensity. A high intensity set would be using a weight that would cause you to get close to failure or failure so that you couldn't perform any additional rep with that weight anymore. The training intensity is also expressed as RPE, which is the abbreviation for rate of perceived exertion or RER, rest in reserve. Both are tools to measure the subjective intensity of a set in your training. Which one you use doesn't matter and can be chosen by preference. The RPE and RER scales ranges from 0 to 10. So an RPE of 10 describes an absolute maximum that you couldn't perform any additional rep in that exercise. And an RPE of 8 means that you perceive the load as if you could have performed a maximum of two additional reps. An RPE of 7 describes an intensity of a set where you could have performed a maximum of maybe three more reps and so on. So now you could express this perceived intensity also in RER, so reps in reserve too. For example, an RPE 8 is equivalent to an RER 2. So both expressions mean you perceived a set as if you could have performed a maximum of two more reps. This expression of training intensity can be used as a progress measurement as well. So if you have performed some sets at RPE 6 in the first two weeks of your program, but then increased the intensity over the following weeks, then that is progress. So working with RPE instead of only looking at weights or reps is especially useful when lifestyle factors come into play. In my hybrid body program, for example, or in programs for my clients, I always set a general goal for a week. So I give instructions like this week we will increase reps and the goal is to maintain the weight or if possible, increase weights slightly. But we also need to consider life happening since we are not living in a vacuum, which is why progress is not linear. Progress is usually an up and down curve that at the end of a period of time should be higher than you have started. The up and downs in progress happen because we are influenced by lifestyle factors like sleep, stress, food, sickness, hormonal cycle, delayed recovery, etc. Especially if one of these scenarios apply, I recommend setting an RPE goal rather than trying to outperform your numbers of the previous week. In other words, I recommend working with the energy you have on that day because your best performance will look different every day and when it drops on one day, it doesn't mean you didn't give your best. So an RPE of six to eight or an RER of four to two is what we are aiming for in each session. An RPE of 10 would be your absolute maximum intensity, which should be just occasionally be tested since it is really taxing for the nervous system and the body needs a lot of time to recover from those sessions. And since the expression of RPE or RER is subjective, it is not something I would training beginners recommend working with because they do not have a good feeling about what an RPE of 10, for example, feels like. But finding the right training intensity will be a topic for a separate episode for one day. So let me know if you're interested in that and just write it in the comments if you want me to do an extra episode for that topic. 
So what I recommend you doing is instead of only focusing on reps and weights, make notes in the plan of your given circumstances. A workout in the heat, sleep deprived, and maybe you're on your period will very likely affect your energy. So you could write down little notes like hot, period, bad sleep. The same applies for good days and PRs. Write down the circumstances that occurred on that day and the day before so that you can retrace why you performed so well on that day. Like nine hours of sleep, higher carb meal, low stress or whatever it is. This allows you to compare your results on a fair level instead of comparing numbers that you did for instance on holidays with low stress and high quality sleep with numbers that you did under high stress and bad sleep circumstances. This false interpretation of performance happens really fast and can make you feel like your performance is decreasing, which is in reality not the case. Now we also have to take into account other variables that make a lift more difficult other than more weight or reps. Like tempo, which describes the time under tension a certain weight has been lifted, the range of motion in which an exercise has been executed, resting periods between sets and pre-fatiguing exercises that may have been performed the day prior or even purposefully right before another exercise or in a superset. And don't worry, I will describe all these three variables in a second. Increasing time under tension is something that I personally like to work with in my training plans for myself, my clients and in my hybrid body program to strengthen a negative phase or also called the eccentric phase of a movement which has the effect to strengthen every range of motion of an exercise. This again has a transfer to the strength in a concentric phase, a pull, lift, push, etc. too. So an example of a movement emphasizing the eccentric phase, also referred as a negative range, would be a barbell back squat with a slow lowering phase of three to four seconds. Another example would be a pause at the bottom of a squatting position. Both examples remove any possible momentum in the ranges performed with increased duration or pauses. Therefore, the difficulty can be increased without using more weight. That means if you see a tempo description in my program, for example, I expect you to use the amount of weight that allows you to perform the given tempo and reps, but no more. So if you have to decrease your weight, it doesn't mean that you lost strength. It's just another type of overloading your muscles and another stimulus. The second factor I've mentioned that can influence your strength is the range of motion in which an exercise is performed because a range of motion can increase with better mobility and technical execution. When I get a new client, I always do a technique check of at least the main lifts like back squats, deadlifts, overhead presses, push-ups, etc. Especially the squat is a very complex movement and is dependent on good ankle and hip mobility is something that clients can improve on a lot. Meaning if a client didn't use the full ability of squat depth, may it be due to limited mobility or lacking technical understanding, awareness or coordination and then improves in these areas, the client might need to compromise on weights to be able to access the full range of motion. That doesn't mean the person got weaker. The opposite is actually the case because a whole other part of the range of motion can be accessed, which usually then accelerates in faster strength gains later on because of a better and more efficient technique. The resting period is the next factor that can influence the intensity of your session or a lift. The shorter rest periods are, the less you can recover between sets. So decreasing resting periods over time are often used to improve strength endurance, to train the body to get used to less 
rest and to accumulate more reps at a certain intensity in a shorter amount of time. This could be a circuit training, EMOM style workout, cluster sets or other workout styles in which rest is limited. I like to incorporate these strategies at the end of a workout to get a nice little sweat in which you will see in my hybrid body program in the finisher and conditioning section of your workouts. And the last aspect I've mentioned was pre-exhaustion. Pre-exhaustion can occur intendedly or unintendedly. So when used intendedly, pre-exhaustion exercises are often isolation exercises performed before complex movements to emphasize a specific muscle group in complex lifts where many muscle groups are working at the same time. So an example would be a glute isolation exercise like single leg hip thrust right before a set of back squats to target the glute muscles even more. This pre-fatigue could result in lower weights being used for the complex movement, but it could also result in more strength depending on the intensity of the pre-exhaustion. So I love to incorporate glute activation exercises like banded glute bridges at a light intensity and for higher reps to fire the glutes better in a squat. That should help you to use more weight in a squat. So this is a different story than performing six to eight reps of heavy hip thrust right before your squat set. So keep the amount of intensity used before a complex movement in mind. An unintendedly pre-exhaustion would be a slightly sore muscle group from a training session or other activity performed the days before the current training session. I think it's totally fine to work out even when you are still a little bit sore in some muscle groups that will be targeted in that session if the schedule doesn't allow it differently. I'm not saying you should always train on sore muscles and risk overtraining syndrome. I am saying that if it happens to be the case in one week and only parts of the areas being trained are feeling still slightly sore or a little bit heavy, it is okay to do the workout if you adjust the intensity appropriately. That being said, if you are reducing the weight on that day, it doesn't mean that you are not making progress because you're basically training with increased difficulty, which in that case is the pre-fatigue from the previous days. So just the added training session in your workout history itself is an increase in volume over time. A light training session could even stimulate recovery in those fatigued muscle groups. So it's important for people to consider this to avoid frustration and to make appropriate adjustments independent of their ego. But it is equally important to notice if those days occur very often and to adjust the training plan so that you're optimally working out as fresh and recovered as possible. Although it's hard to quantify progress when variables that increase difficulty come into play, like the ones I just mentioned, time and attention, range of motion, pre-fatigue and resting time, it is important to keep those in mind when you need to adjust training weights or reps to remind yourself that this doesn't mean you lost strength. The athlete that is able to work out without an ego is in my opinion the smartest one so if you are the type of person who is more afraid of doing too little than too much which i can relate to very well then remind yourself of the sentence of a wise person that told me if you think you're doing too little you very likely won't the ones that don't even think about whether they do enough or not usually could train at a higher intensity. And that wise person is actually my husband, by the way. So to summarize, all the possible ways in which you can make progress are an increase in weight, total load, aka volume, and increased intensity, also expressed in RPE or RER, which can be induced by either more weight, more reps, shorter resting time, longer time on attention or pre-fatiguing exercises. 
And additionally, you should always keep in mind potential lifestyle factors that can have an impact on the intensity of your training session. And the main contributing factors are here, sleep, nutrition, and stress of any kind, like weather circumstances or mental stress, like job or family related, and many others. Lastly, I would like to get into the expectation of strength progress just briefly because there are no precise numbers like an increase of a certain weight percentage that you should be able to increase in your first training year or the second and so on. But thanks to Greg Knuckles, one of the authors and scientists of Stronger by Science, we can get a rough idea about what amount of strength gains to expect when lifting for three months, six months, 12 months, and so on. So he prepared an article based on his survey and research and lists the increased weights for men and women in exercises like back squats, bench press, deadlifts, and a few more at different training ages. And instead of throwing a bunch of numbers at you, I want to give you just one example of the back squat to illustrate realistic strength gains that you can make. Men that train for zero to three months increase their back squat on average by 9.9 kilograms per month and women by 3.6 kilograms. Men that work out for six to three months increase their weight in the back squat by four kilograms monthly and women by 3.1 kilograms monthly on average. Men and women that train for six to 12 months increase their weights by 2.1 and one kilogram on average per month. And once they reach the one to two year mark, they increase their weights by 0.7 kilograms for men and 0.3 kilograms for women. And men had another increase of 0.7 kilograms on average in the training years from two to five years. In contrast, women in this survey didn't make any strength progress anymore at this point and a decreasing trend in improved strength gains in general was visible in the other lifts like deadlifts, bench press, etc. as well, the more training experience a person had. So although the numbers do not represent the whole population, they showcase a realistic weight range you can increase in your future months and years of training. So I'm pointing that out because many people have no perspective at all on how much weight they should be able to lift or increase. And some believe that a five kilograms increase in back squat from one week to the other is little, although this is actually a massive jump. Of course, the expected increase in weight is very individual for every type of exercise, but that would go beyond the scope of a podcast episode. And I think it's neither necessary nor possible to know the expected number for strength gain of each existing exercise and person. Therefore, the best practical advice I can give you here is to increase your weights slowly. For compound barbell movements like back squats and deadlifts or variations of it, I like to say around 1.25 to 2.5 kilograms on each side. And for more isolation based movements, you could occasionally shoot for an increase of one to two kilograms. So again, these are just guidelines and I just want you to give you an idea so that you feel more confident at the gym and don't expect that you have to increase your weights in every session and you will get a better feel when you tested multiple sets and multiple increases and this will always be something you just need to do a little bit trial and error but once you did that you will have a framework of weights that you know you can handle for each exercise And then you just test out how much room you have on that day and how much you can increase. And if you're a person who is more afraid of using more weight, then I would recommend you that you increase your weight and just do as many reps as you can, even if it's less than the prescribed reps in your program. This is more a mental training and challenge to get a feel for a higher load. And another tip is, if possible, to ask a friend to spot you to reduce the fear of not being able to lift a certain weight. 
But again, increase slowly to let your body adapt to higher loads. And even if you are an experienced athlete in the gym, I would want you to increase up to your working load step by step in your warm up sets so that your muscles and nervous system can adjust to the load instead of jumping right into your close to maximum weights. But there are other types of progress you can make performance wise besides your strength levels. Those of you who have followed me for quite a while or if you are in my hybrid body program know that I'm a big advocate for combining weight training, body weight strength, endurance, skill and mobility. When we look at endurance based improvements, you can see progress when comparing your average pace per kilometer or mile or the total duration in which you completed a certain distance, for example, a 5k or a 10k run. Another metric to gauge your performance is your heart rate. The optimal heart rate will look different for everyone. But if you notice your heart rate is lower at the same pace for a similar distance, this is generally a good thing. Like we can express the perceived intensity and strength with RPE, we can use the same intensity scale for running. In fact, this scale was invented for rating endurance based workouts first and was then transferred to strength training. And this is what I love about RPE. It works for so many types of sports and gives your training a language you can use to measure your training or progress without having to get deep into data. An RPE of 10, for example, expresses an all-out sprint in running. An RPE of 9 describes a very hard intensity level where it's hard to speak for you. And an RPE of 8 would be training at a hard intensity where you can talk but maybe just a few words and so on. So if you want to get the full scale of intensity, then make sure to subscribe to my newsletter in which I give information and tips supplementary to my podcast topics. And then you will see the full scale for strength and endurance. In general, working with RPE allows you to compare your intensity instead of your pace which is excellent for the same reason as in strength related workouts when you are sleep deprived traveled a lot had a stressful day or week that's why rpe is such a great tool it prioritizes how you feel and your effort over the result lastly i want to talk about noticing improvements in your mobility which is often overlooked and underrated one way to observe progress is by taking a picture or record a video of a mobility exercise for example trying to reach your hands towards the ground or a strength exercise that requires good mobility like the squat of course you don't have to do that for every mobility exercise but at least for the exercises addressing the areas and joints in which you want to gain mobility. Another way to track mobility progress is something that I did as a kid when I wanted to learn a middle split. I measured the maximum distance between my feet. We had a parquet floor which was perfect for learning a split. So I took a piece of tape, marked the ends of my feet and tried to reach further over the tape every time I practiced. Mobility progress is also the ability to access a range of motion faster and more consistently. Maybe you had to open up for a long time to get into a nice deep squatting position and now you can get into it after a few minutes or even in a cold state. That shows that your baseline of mobility has significantly improved. In all areas we discussed, it is important to remember that Progress depends on what you compare your current state with, which is why a structured workout plan is essential. I'm not saying you can't make progress with random workouts, but it's much less likely and less likely to see. A structured workout plan allows you to measure and track progress. It is a structured and more predictable approach to reach your goals instead of trying things randomly, which usually leads to frustration and committing to a plan helps you to stay 
consistent. As I already mentioned, if you are interested in a program designed to improve your strength, endurance and mobility, my hybrid body program is perfect for you and I will link all the information and the program link in the video description below and in the show notes if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any other platform. If this episode was helpful to you, please share this one with your family, friends to get more people aware of the Art of Health podcast. And the best way to support me is by leaving a five star review on Spotify or Apple podcast and subscribing to my channel. It takes just one second for you and it helps me tremendously. And for any content wishes, feel free to write in the comments below what you would like to see next or shoot me an email at mail at mariesteffen.com. And that's it for today, guys. Stay strong, healthy and flexible and I see you in the next one.